1948, uh, Claude Shannon published a seminal paper that answered the question of how much information can be sent on a signal that is degraded by noise. Shannon considered classical additive Gaussian noise. Uh, Jim, with a great knowledge of uh, quantum noise, thought that there could be limitation on capacity by this quantum noise. So he took on himself to calculate the capacity of, uh, of optical systems at optical frequency that suffers from quantum noise. And um, Mark Steiff uh, will tell us about Jim's work uh, on, on quantum communication, which was the earliest capacity studies done for quantum communication. I have to tell you that a couple of weeks ago, I browsed through the uh, Clio website, I saw the title of my talk, and I suddenly became terrified. Uh, for one, I am uh, an optical communication scientist, classical optical communication scientist, much more than I am an expert in quantum information. And the other thing was that the birth of quantum communication preceded my own birth, and I realized that I'm going to be talking in front of a panel of distinguished people who were there when it happened and actually contributed to it, which was another thing that terrified me. And then I, in the end, I decided that perhaps I am somewhat qualified to talk about these subjects through Jim's eyes because this is how I was exposed to it in the first place. And so I decided to come and not escape <laughs> in the last minute. At any rate, uh, Jim was certainly one of the fathers of, uh, who gave birth to the field of quantum communications. He wrote a number of papers on the subject, most of them in the 1960s. The last one appeared in 1970. But after 1970, he pretty much moved to other fields of research, uh, working with Art Ashkin, with uh, Lynn Molinar, and with other people who will be giving talks here. And, uh, it wasn't until, he wasn't following this field so much during those years, until after his retirement in the late 90s, he started thinking about it again, and in 2003, in particular, he drafted a paper, his last paper on quantum communication that was never published. He handed it to me in 2003, asked me if I want to help him turn this into a paper, and in the end it did not uh, it, was not, it was not submitted for publication, and I want to tell you about this paper here. But before I do that, I should review a little bit of Jim's contributions in the 1960s, the things, maybe just a few of the most famous things that he did. Now, as René mentioned, one of the things in, uh, that, that happened in 1948, uh, Claude Shannon came up with, uh, with information theory, and one of the first questions that came up in the context of uh, quantum information theory is how will Shannon's classical information theory change uh, when, when one takes into account the fact that the universe obeys quantum me mechanical laws. And in 1962, Jim extended Shannon's perhaps most uh, familiar formula, the formula for the capacity, the information capacity of a Gaussian noise channel Jim extended this one to the quantum case, taking into, into account quantum constraints. This is a, a copy from, from the original paper, from Jim's paper. And uh, this formula, I don't think that anybody doubts it correct, its correctness, but Jim never proved it. He was not very uh, anxious about mathematical proofs. I will talk about it briefly later on. And I don't think that anybody proved it rigorously, but nobody doubts that, that this is correct. And this was mostly the case with Jim Gordon. He was never wrong with, with his guesses. Uh, later, on in, later on in 1963, there was a conference in Varena in Italy. And uh, Jim gave a talk there. Uh, a year later, the proceedings of that conference came out. And he had a paper in the proceedings. Uh, and in those proceedings, he came up with perhaps one of the most famous results in quantum information to date. It is a bound for the mutual information in a generic system, namely, it is a bound to how fast one can transmit information anywhere from, receiver, from transmitter to receiver. And he expressed it in terms of the von Neumann entropy, with rho being the density matrix. And again, he didn't prove it, he conjectured it. In this case, he, he actually said that he's conjecturing it and the proof is missing. The proof was provided in 1973 by Alexander Holevo. 
And remarkably, in 1998, Alexander Holevo has also shown that this is not just a bound to the uh, mutual information, it was the mutual information itself. And this is now famously known as the Holevo theorem or the Holevo capacity, but Jim Gordon was the first to write it on paper many, many years before it became famous. This was in 1964, long before optical communications was even, was even a reality. Later on in a related subject, uh, quantum measurement theory, uh, together with W.H. Luisel in 1966, I was already born at that time. Uh, okay, but I, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't participating in this. Uh, uh, in 1966, uh, they wrote a paper that appeared in a, in a collection, in a book that had a collection, collection of papers called Physics of Quantum Electronics. And in, in this paper, they, they asked themselves the question of what happens when one tries to measure simultaneously non-compatible quantities, such as position and momentum, or more relevant for this conference, the two quadratures of the electric field, which are similar to position and momentum in terms of of the uncertainty principles that they obey. And, uh, and they came up with the conclusion that one measures, uh, under certain assumptions, one measures a measurement state, as they called it, psi r of m, which is the set of measurement states were not orthogonal to each other, they were not normalized, their norm was smaller than one, but they formed the resolution of the identity operator. And those of you who are familiar with quantum measurement theory to some extent will immediately recognize that this is the predecess predecessor of the famous POVM, the Positive Operator Valued Measure, which is the workhorse of quantum measurement theory today, and it has been for many years. This happened in 1966. Uh, well, I went too far, but maybe I'll stay here. I should tell you how I come into the picture, maybe not this picture, but the picture in general. In 1997, I was a postdoc in uh, AT&T Labs, and I met Jim. He was then a, a recently retired um, legend from Bell Labs. I knew of him, of course. And I proposed that he comes to give uh, lectures uh, at AT&T. He agreed. He gave a few lectures. It sort of uh, faded away, but we remained friends after that point, and we stayed friends until, essentially, until the end of his life. And uh, the way it went was that, that we discussed many things. Some of them were science. A lot of them were science, actually. I would ask him things that I wanted to understand. But he would uh, send me uh, or give me many of his notes. Some were handwritten notes. Some were notes that he typed. And he would send them to me. And I would read them. And then we would discuss them. And he sort of enjoyed the process of me asking him stupid questions about things that he wrote. And. Uh, and initially, his notes were about uh, quantum, about, sorry, about uh, propagation effects in fibers. He was a big expert in that, and this was sort of my field of research, and, and it matched. And then suddenly, he started moving more and more towards quantum physics, which was a problem for me. I'm an electrical engineer. I had absolutely no background in this, so I had to study these things, and I did that. And then in 2003, this paper that I told you about arrived. He handed me this paper. He suggested that, that I help him turn it into a publication. And I want to tell you what's, what was in it briefly. So what, was he, what he was considering was a standard communication setting. There was a transmitter, a receiver, and a path, a physical path that connects them. The transmitter wants to transmit some classical information to the receiver, a classical message. It can be represented by a number, a regular classical number, T. So it encodes this number on a physical object. Jim called it the transmitted physical object. It could be a photon, but it could also be a baseball with the letter T written on it. And then the transmitter sends the object, it sends it off to the receiver. And the receiver is equipped with measurement apparatus that measures the object and produces a number, another number, R. And the way that communication systems, not necessarily quantum, in general communication systems are characterized by the probability of receiving R given the T was transmitted. Quantum mechanically, this is described as follows. The transmitter puts the physical object in a quantum state represented by a density matrix, rho T. This is the density operator. The path distorts the density matrix, making rho prime of T as a result of noise or, or attenuation or whatever it can be. And then the receiver measures it where, where the measurement is represented by the POVM. Jim 
reinvented the POVM in this paper. In fact, he, he did not call it the POVM, he called it the measurement operator. He, he was not aware of, of, of its use in, 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 in the literature. He, I think that he continued from his 1966 paper and he extended it to, to make it essentially the same thing as we now know as POVM. And then the probability that one is interested in is given by the rho prime t multiplied by sigma r and the trace of the product. This is well known, but Jim's point was also that this is not the only way of looking at it. Instead of looking at it this way, one can attribute the path to the receiver, saying that the path is part of the measurement apparatus, in which case, instead of distorting the density matrix of the state, it distorts the measurement matrix of the receiver. And so the measurement is now described by sigma prime of R instead of sigma of R. In this case, P of R given T is equal to the trace of rho T times sigma prime of R. And the two have to be the same because they describe the same physical problem, which means that there is a duality, a very important duality. This was one of Jim's main points in this paper, the duality between state preparation and state measurement. For example, he showed or he explained there that what a lossy path does to a density operator is the same or equivalent to what a path with gain, an amplifying path, does to the measurement operator. And one can look at it either way, whatever is more convenient. This is not an obvious, it's a very deep observation. And this was one of the points that he made. He also made some other points. He talked about the situations in which, examples in which the transmitted physical object is a two-level system, which is the qubit, essentially or about the case in which the transmitted physical object is a simple harmonic oscillator, which is the case of optical communications. And he talked about the Wigner density and other things. Now, I don't want to go into more details. I hope that I gave you a glimpse on what, what is in this paper. But the interesting thing is that Jim decided not to submit it for publication in the end. And I think that through our interaction, through our, through, through, through our discussions, I think that he was discouraged by the amount of literature of papers that were published on quantum communications over the years that he, he was not aware of. And I think, and this is my interpretation, that he was also not very happy with how his style of, of treating the problem fit the way that qu the quantum communication community operates in more recent uh, times, in, in, in the past decade or two or three. And, uh, and he decided not to submit it at that point for publication. And uh, I think that while preparing for this talk, I was sort of trying to recall, and I looked at our emails, email exchange and so on, and I thought that there, there's no way to ignore, I mean, the, the, there was no way not to notice the huge difference between Jim's approach to the quantum communications problem and the approach that is observed in most modern papers on the subject, which are very formal in the mathematical sense. They have a a theorem proof kind of structure, and I'm not judging, I'm not saying that this is necessarily worse, but this is what, what, what is going on today in many cases, whereas Jim's approach was completely different. He did not care about proofs. He cared, he, he liked mathematics a lot. I, I saw him use mathematics, he enjoyed using mathematics and doing things with mathematical equations, but only in order to arrive at a result. He did not believe mathematics. To believe a result, he had to know that it is correct. He had to check it against his intuition, against his physical intuition. And once he knew that it was correct, he didn't try to prove it anymore. He did not have, he did not have to think about formal proofs to his, uh, to his uh, results. And when I think of it, it is very similar to the way that one solves a crossword puzzle. And Jim, as many of you know, was a big fan of crossword puzzles. One tries to guess a solution. And one tries to, to fill the puzzle in a way that all the words match, its, match each other. And when one finds a solution where everything matches everything, then one knows that it has to be the correct solution. There's no need in a formal mathematical proof because what are the chances that there are two solutions to the same puzzle if the puzzle is complicated enough? And this is very much how Jim would approach a physics problem as well. He would make sure that everything matches everything but he would essentially guess the solution. I would come to him and tell, I would often ask him, how, how did you know that? How did you get to this result? And I was expecting a derivation, and his only answer was, well, well what else can it be? I mean, this is the only thing that makes sense. There's nothing else that works there. And, and it is very similar to, to crossword puzzle. And then I was very proud of myself 
Last week when I came up with this analogy, I thought that I was very smart, and then I realized that Jim planted this understanding in me uh, sometime before he died. It was approximately two months or three months before he died, slightly before he lost his ability to speak clearly. I, I, we spoke over the phone, and uh, I asked him, we talked, and I asked him how he was filling his time. I mean, he couldn't do many things. He was pretty sick. And he told me that he, he, was, solving, he, that he was solving crossword puzzles. And then he paused for a fraction of a second, and then he told me, you know, Mark, in a way I've been solving crossword puzzles my entire life. And I think that what he meant is what I showed to you in the previous slide. So this paper has not been published, as I told you, but it should be published because it contains many insights. And even if there are things in it that are not entirely new, because he didn't read all the literature that was published between 1970 and 2003, it contains insights that only few people are capable of, and he, he, he was one of them. And therefore, it should be published and with Susie Gordon's agree, uh, consent, I have decided to post it somewhere. It, was not, it is not easy because the archive, for example, are not willing to take it because it's PDF and because it's third party and I have to convince him that uh, I cannot. Uh, but it will be posted. I will post it on the web and I will try to put the link to it, certainly on my own website, but on, maybe on Jim's Wikipedia page, I will add the link to it. So all of you who are interested, please log on and, and, and read and enjoy. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>